I, I want to thank you very much for, for having me. Um, I've been fortunate enough to be involved speaking with this group for quite a while now. Um, I'm sure many of you know Janice Schwartz Donahue. And she and her, her daughter Jessica, uh, who was a patient of mine, uh, Janice still comes to see me every three months. They were the ones that recruited me to get involved with this organization when you had your every other year meetings in Philadelphia. I, I remember speaking at the Adams Mark uh, when it was still there and, and out in King of Prussia. And, um, you know, I do a fair amount of lecturing uh, both at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, nationally, I've been in Europe twice in the last year presenting uh, dental implant meetings. And this is my favorite lecture to give because this is the one lecture I give that I know everybody in the room wants to be here to hear me, at least in the beginning. And nobody needs continuing education credits or already paid for the conference or they're stuck listening to me. So I, I hope to keep this as informal as possible. Any questions, by all means, interrupt me. I have three kids. I'm used to being interrupted on a regular basis. and. Uh, and fire away, but you know, this, this will probably be a little bit less intense than some of the presentations that you've heard, um, dealing with, with certainly the very significant medical challenges that you've had. Um, but I think something that gets ignored with the transplant patients in particular are the dental considerations. And as a periodontist, my particular specialty in dentistry probably has the greatest connection for the transplant patient. So first I should start off by saying, by explaining what a periodontist is. I have friends that still call me and say, I need a root canal, can you do it for me? And I've been in practice now 14 years and I have friends and relatives that still don't know what I do. A periodontist is a dentist who specializes with an additional three years of training after dental school in the prevention diagnosis and treatment of periodontal diseases. And periodontists also specialize in surgical aspects of dental implant therapy. And a lot of patients will come to my office and say, you know, I looked up on the internet what I think I need. And there's probably more bad information than there is reliable information on the internet. Uh, but if any of you have any genuine interest or concerns in periodontal diseases, which hopefully I don't squash by the end of the lecture, uh, or any interest in finding a periodontist where you live, uh, the American Academy of Periodontology is the site. This is the website, www.perio.org. And it has, this is actually an outdated photo, but the website is really very patient friendly and can really help you gain some information that is as accurate as, as I think any site could possibly deliver the information. Uh, there is no corporate bias. There is no bias really in any capacity other than that you see a periodontist, uh, not a general dentist for the concerns. So it's www.perio.org. And one of the hottest topics in my field, in periodontics, in the last few years has become the connection between the dental health of our patients and their overall systemic health, their overall health. Can disease in the mouth really affect the entire body? And there, this has been an area that I think the medical community has been very slow to come over and look at. And so in our field, we've really been the ones given the opportunity and the responsibility bring this to the forefront of patient care. And you may have seen in the papers, not nearly enough as it should be mentioned, uh, links between periodontal disease and other conditions, heart disease, stroke, respiratory diseases, high cholesterol, and so forth. But it's now finally starting to make it uh, into the mainstream. Now this is a quote from over 10 years ago that cardiovascular disease claims almost a million lives in the United States and that stroke will also claim 160,000 people each year. And this is from 10 years ago, 
And so we know that systemic diseases, cardiovascular diseases in general, are a very, very serious concern for the public. And there are also some thoughts that cardiovascular disease claims the lives of more women than men. So let's talk about what periodontal diseases are and how they can be connected to our patient's overall health. Evie Renard, why don't you introduce yourself? <laughs> Renard Petronzio, I'm a uh, heart and uh, kidney at Honolulu six years ago. And I'm very interested in what you have to say because I want to talk about preventative medicine in the manner of the teeth. That's my pleasure, even though you're wearing a Yankee hat. Right? <laughs> <laughs> as far as it goes. <laughs> 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 if, it, if it's easier for you to see, okay. why don't you come on over this side so you can both sit together and you'll be looking at the slides as opposed to looking away from it. Hi, Marie. Come on. Come on. <laughs> if you don't touch the keyboard, you're even allowed to sit here. Oh, thank you. Yes. And this is Mrs. Petronzio, Marie. Barry the dentist. Or dent the periodontist. He's more than that. Go ahead, Barry. I'm sorry. Okay. So, we talk about periodontal disease, and people will say, well, what are periodontal disease? What is gum disease? And so periodontal diseases are bacterial infections under the gum line that destroy healthy bone and, the, and its attachment to the teeth. And the difference between health and periodontitis or periodontal disease would be the pink, healthy gums seen in health and healthy bone levels up nice and high around the teeth where nature put them. And the periodontal diseases are caused by plaque, tartar, which is calcified or mineralized plaque, causing bone loss and this pocketing. And the word pocket is sometimes mentioned at the general dentist. Some dentists, hopefully more and more, will, will perform periodontal probing or the hygienist will. Some of you may have the experience of sitting in a chair and hearing numbers like, Three, two, three, three, two, three, five, seven, eight. Hopefully not too many fives and sevens and eights. But this is the pocketing that is talked about when diagnosing periodontal disease. So this is a model, of a very close-up photo of a model that I use in my office when I explain periodontal disease to my patients. And on the healthy side, the gums are up right up against the teeth. On the periodontitis side, we have tartar, which is visible, which is one of the causative agents, plaque and tartar, of periodontal disease. And the bone under the gum line, on the side of health, sits up nice and snug near the gum line, at the top of the teeth. And the bones are usually not mobile, or loose. the teeth are usually not mobile or loose, and the bone levels with advanced periodontal disease, as you can see, are significantly worse off, or as you would say, there's greater bone loss caused by this plaque and tartar than you would see in a state of total health. And so this is the type of disease that we are treating when we're talking about treating gum disease or periodontal disease. We have healthy bone levels where there's very little root surface between the crest of the bone and where the gum line would sit. And then we have advanced bone levels to the point where teeth start moving, and this will progress over time in most cases and eventually lead to tooth loss. And there are certainly stages of periodontal disease as in any disease form. And the first stage that is usually not diagnosed or not treated is gingivitis. Gingivitis would simply be redness, swelling, and usually bleeding of the gums either spontaneously or with brushing or flossing. And the important thing to point out is that gingivitis is totally reversible. If you brush, if you floss, if you get things cleaned up in a relatively quick manner, there's no evidence that the crime was ever committed and gingivitis can revert itself back to health. Now in mild periodontal disease, we will see bone loss typically up to about 20% bone loss around the teeth, there is tissue damage in the gums, deepening pockets. 
And this will be the, natu the natural progression in most cases. Now, everybody is certainly different. There are patients who will come in to see me with gingivitis that is just on fire, and they have no bone loss. And they're in their 60s, and it looks like they never met a toothbrush they like. <laughs> and they're to see me because they broke a tooth and they need an implant. And then patients will come and see me with very pristine oral hygiene, and yet the periodontal disease is really running away from them. The bone is just running from their teeth. And, and that has a lot to do with their overall genetics and immune defenses against this type of infection. In the moderate to advanced types of periodonti periodontitis, we'll see 20 to 50% bone loss, greater than 50% bone loss in the advanced periodontitis or periodontal diseases. And the advanced bone loss and tissue destruction will frequently lead to tooth loss over time if left untreated. So on the model, if we extract these teeth with advanced periodontal disease, you can see the rings of tartar or fake tartar on these teeth because I don't want to upset my patients and show them they'll extract the teeth. But this is not that different from what it actually looks like as you will see. And so this is what we would call a premolar or a bicuspid tooth coming from a socket like so, and an upper molar tooth that normally has three separate roots. And the bone loss can develop to the point where there is no longer bone between the roots of these teeth. And that is when the prognosis of these upper molar teeth becomes pretty poor in most cases. And this is just a photo I took of a, of a, of a woman who I was treating uh, after I had removed all of the plaque and tartar during her surgery. I figured this group is probably not that faint uh, of so we, can, we won't get too graphic, but this is with the gum reflected back during a periodontal surgery. She had a deep pocket and pus under the gum line, and you can see here this, what we would call a keyhole defect or bone loss. This is the bone like so, and she is lost, starting to lose the bone between the two roots of the upper molar facing the cheek surface. <clears throat> of rubber tooth. And this would just represent the bone loss. So what are the warning signs of periodontal disease? How do you know that you may be experiencing periodontal disease? Well, if your gums bleed easily, that is a sign of inflammation. Now that may be gingivitis, that may be more serious periodontal destruction such as bone loss and periodontal. And I should clarify, Gingivitis is reversible. Periodontitis is not. I, I use the analogy of diabetes when I talk about periodontal disease with my patients. Once a patient has periodontitis, they always have periodontitis. There is no cure for periodontitis. There is, anytime I ever have a patient say, well, I know I had it, and they cured me, and now I have it again. And I have to somehow be very diplomatic about explaining that there really is no cure. The goal in treating periodontal disease is to arrest the inflammation, arrest the bone loss, the progression of the bone loss, and in many cases, as we'll see, potentially grow some of that bone attachment back around the teeth. But the maintenance is very, very important in terms of not having what you, I guess you would refer to as a relapse of active periodontal breakdown. The gums may be red, swollen, sore, itchy. I've had patients say, my gums itch. And itching is one sign of inflammation. Maybe Real quick, why don't you introduce yourself so our speaker knows who you are. Hi, everyone. Alfonso Brown, senior. This is Dr. Barry. Hello, Are you going to be able to see me okay? I'm fine. Okay. Because the seat back here is easier for you. Another warning sign of periodontal disease would be pus between the teeth and gums. And it's amazing how many patients will come and see me and not be aware that they have pus. But I'll say, I'll ask questions like, do you get a sour or a bitter taste? And I'll say yes. And frequently that's caused from pus around the gum line. Teeth tend to come loose. If the bone is lost around the teeth, the support of the teeth 
becomes poor and the teeth will become loose. And I'll explain this to a patient as if you, know, if you put your umbrella pole in the sand on the beach and you pack the sand tight, the umbrella doesn't go anywhere. If you start scooping the sand away from that pole, it gets a little wobbly. And that same thing happens when teeth lose their bone support. There could be a change in the bite because of that lack of bone support. The teeth may start shifting from pressure of the teeth in the opposite jaw, pressure from the tongue, from the lips, and so forth. Bad breath. I had a woman in the office Monday, and the daughter said to me, can you do something about her breath? <laughs> and there is actually, there, you'll never find it in a textbook, but ask any periodontist if they know what perio breath is, and they will tell you they do, because the bacteria that frequently cause this infection what we call the anaerobic bacteria, they function without oxygen and they're deep into the tissues and they produce a lot of gases and it smells. And so on the very severe cases, you can even sometimes smell the severity of periodontal disease. And certainly patients that wear partial dentures, the wire clasp, snap in to replace some of the teeth may not fit so well once the supporting teeth become loose. So what does periodontitis look like in an advanced stage? This is a woman who now is about four years post-active treatment and is totally healthy. But we have redness at the gum line. Gums should not look glossy, shiny. They should look more like an orange peel or stipple. Barry, I got to point out to the audience. Sure. On, your, on the screen back here, it's much redder and flesh colored for some reason or other, the projector is losing a lot of the color. So when he say redness, I look at that and it's not very red. Here it's red. So uh, Thank you. imagine what he's saying. It's, it's, well, I wanted to point out that when tissue, when gums start looking shiny and glassy, that's not a sign of health. That's a sign of tissue destruction under the surface. This bleeding was spontaneous. There was no probing going on at this time. This was a picture I took at this woman's initial visit to see me. There's going to recession. You can see where the enamel ends on her tooth. And this is root surface because the gums have pulled back. She's had gum recession. And here is the pus. You can see this little white, liquidy appearance here at the gum line here. When I took my thumb and kind of pressed on that, a large amount of the pus just oozed right out from the pus. And she was in total comfort. She was not in discomfort at all. Her dentist referred her to me. And she had already lost one tooth in the back. And this is what tartar, or as the, the official word for tartar is calculus. I hate when my hygienist says to my patients, you have a lot of calculus, because I always think she's trying to get them to open up a map. <laughs> it's a tartar, tartar, tartar. I don't know what calculus is. This is calculus, or tartar, at the gum line. In the lower jaw, there are salivary glands under the tongue that spray your mouth with saliva, and most saliva has mineral content, calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, and any plaque that will accumulate on these teeth will become calcified very quickly. In the upper jaw, it's the molar tooth. Closer to the front, there's a salivary gland in the cheek. And that tooth will frequently have tartar on it as well. But I will see what we call here a calculus bridge. And these patients will say, I don't know how I got this. I floss every day. And I'll say, how could you floss every day when it won't go through? But I won't say that, but I, I say that in here. And then I say, OK, well, we're going to get you to floss better. And this is, this is tartar that we form on a patient, and she has no discomfort whatsoever. Now this is the woman who came in Monday with the daughter who complained about the breath. She came in as an emergency patient to see me, and this tooth was in her upper right, and it was killing her. And she begged me, I usually will see a patient do an examination, make a diagnosis, explain the kind of treatment that we need to perform to get their mouths to be healthy, and then we start. She came in to see me. She had seen my old partner who's retired three and a half years. She hasn't been in my office in five years. She hasn't had a dental cleaning in five years. And she's diabetic. She smokes. 
She's 83 years old and she's on about 17 different medications. And she came in and begged me to extract this tooth. And so this is what tartar looks like. And when I looked at it on the table, I said, you know what? Given this presentation Wednesday night, and I've, got, <laughs> and I've got pictures on the model, but they might not buy it because it's the model. So I'm going to see the my assistant grab my camera. I'm going to take a picture. This is this is a ring of tartar that went all the way around her tooth, and you can see this was the bottom. This is the bottom of the socket, the bottom of the bucket where that root sits, and you can see how little bone was left holding this tooth. And it, this took me longer to get her numb and comfortable than it did to extract the tooth. I could have, these are what we call pepper shaker extractions. You give her a pepper shaker and she would sneeze it out. <laughs> it, was so, it was so loose. But this is, this is hot off the presses from Monday and I just wanted to use it as a, as a visual aid uh, to compare it to what that model was. So what are the risk factors for periodontal disease? Number one is smoking tobacco use. You show me a smoker, I'll show you some form of periodontal disease in patients. Diabetes, it's almost unheard of that an adult with diabetes doesn't have some form of periodontal disease. As we get older, the risks of periodontal disease become greater. Gender is a little controversial, probably more so because men are lazy and don't go to doctors as, as frequently as women do. So things get away from them a little bit more. Uh, medications are a big one, and we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Stress is a huge risk factor for periodontal disease. I'm sure your group has talked before about stress and the hormones produced during stress compromising the immune system. And that would certainly apply here with an infectious disease such as periodontitis. Genetics, like I mentioned earlier, we have some patients who come in and just they just can't have more plaque in their mouth if they went looking for it, and have very little bone loss, and they are genetically just not very susceptible to the breakdown. And then other patients will come in with just immaculate oral hygiene, and things are just the bone is melting away like, like hot wax. And so we have to be more aggressive with those patients. And frequently when someone will come to me for periodontal treatment, one of my history questions will include, do parents have their teeth? Do they have all of their teeth? Have they seen a periodontist before? And it's almost unanimous that one, if not both parents, have had some form of tooth loss or periodontal treatment. Poor nutrition affects everything, including the mouth. We can go all the way back to the British sailors with scurvy and the lack of citrus fruits and vitamin C causing destruction of the bone and gums and hormonal changes. And osteoporosis, which is a topic that kind of goes back and forth with us, but, but certainly any condition that will make the bone less dense is going to be more vulnerable to any kind of bone destructive process like periodontitis. Now this past year, our Journal of Periodontology, along with the American Journal of Cardiology, there was a conference. Thank God, finally, the cardiologist sat down with the periodontists and came out with a position paper and talked about the link of periodontitis to atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And patients that have an uncomplicated periodontal disease, plaque, they have tartar, pockets, bone loss. Typically their random or routine blood work will show no systemic signs of infection. They won't have a fever. People don't come in to see me and say, you've got to help me, I feel terrible. There's no fever. They don't have ele elevated white blood cell counts. Now the possible causes for the relationship between periodontitis and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, there are two main possible links. The first is that there are increased levels of systemic inflammation with periodontal disease. Periodontal disease is an inflammatory disease, like rheumatoid arthritis is an inflammatory disease. And C-reactive protein, other biomarkers of inflammation are present with an infection. And because you can't see it, 
typically patients will not be diagnosed with it or seek treatment for it, but treatment of periodontal disease can reduce these levels of systemic inflammatory markers. Your C-reactive protein, if elevated with untreated periodontal disease, may go down with treatment. And the bacteria themselves have been cultured in these plaques or atheromas. There have been plaques removed from angioplasties, and they have found the same bacteria that cause plaque and tartar around teeth in these plaques. So some generalized statements came from this conference. And the medical evaluation of patients with periodontal disease should include a blood lipid profile consisting of the total cholesterol, LDL, HDL, fasting triglycerides, and the blood sugar or the blood glucose measure. Also, plasma C-reactive protein is usually optional with routine blood work, but it should be considered because it may help determine how aggressively the standard risk factors should be treated, especially things like lifestyle. If there is smoking, which is a lifestyle risk, stress, things of this nature, that, that is something that brings the risk of cardiovascular disease up as well. Okay. Including the medications? Absolutely. So the plasma CRP should be done then. Because I'm on like 17 different meds. Right. Yeah. So I should have my doctor do the uh, plasma CRP. You know, that, that is the recommendation from the conference. It, it's, it's always controversial if a periodontist says you should really have your CRP. Yeah. Evaluated, um, but I don't think any physician would have, you know, great difficulty relating that yeah. to the presence of inflammation. Now, if they look at your overall health and find, I don't see any infections. You don't have rheumatoid arthritis. I don't know why you would have elevated systemic inflammatory markers yeah. such as CRP. You know, diagnosing periodontal disease or, or attempting to diagnose it would certainly be a logical step okay. along those lines. Jim, excuse me. Do we interrupt you? Uh, yes. Please, it's okay. Please interrupt me. <laughs> you know I will. <laughs> no, go ahead. Uh, did you have a question? No, I got the end Okay. But why don't you finish? Okay. Thank you. Now, for the transplant patient, we have some special considerations. Certainly the medications that you guys are on, and we'll talk about that. The link between periodontitis and heart disease is certainly a primary concern. Immunosuppression to prevent rejection of the organs that we transplant that leaves the patient more vulnerable to infection, such as periodontitis. Bacterial infections are certainly something that everybody should want to avoid, but everyone in this room in particular. Uh, the need for pre-medication prior to dental visits, which is extremely controversial in the last year or so, and pre-transplant dental treatment. And, and certainly, th this is something that applies not only to organ transplants, but also joint replacements, hips, shoulders, knees. Now, I'm a periodontist, and so the majority, I'm an Elkins Park periodontist, so my patient population is probably <coughs> Three quarters are over 55. And once a month, I'm asked to sign a, a dental release so that a knee can be done, or a hip can be done, or a shoulder can be done. And I have had to refuse a few times because I've had patients who come for their hygiene. I've said, hey, look, you've got some pockets that are coming back, and I really want to treat them. And they don't bother me. It's too expensive. I don't want to deal with it. And now, They'll come in and say, I'm scheduled in three weeks to have a knee, and I need you to sign this. <laughs> I can't. And then I'm the bad guy. I said, why can't you sign this? Said, because you have an infection. And the considerations for the transplant patient are the same. So pre-transplant dental therapy, and this would also pertain to joint replacement. Yeah. The, uh, the medication that we take before we see the dentist, how is that? Become an issue. Um, you said it's a con. It is, and I'm going to get to it in about a minute. Okay, no problem. I promise. I, okay. it, it's, it's very important. So, believe okay. me, it's a big chunk of what we're going to talk about. Okay. Okay. 
Now, pre-transplant therapy, all teeth that would be considered hopeless need to come out because they are sources of infection. I, I remember during my training going into the OR to remove all 32 teeth on a gentleman in his 30s who had done so much cocaine in his teenage years and 20s that he had developed cardiomyopathy and he was getting a heart and all the teeth had to go before he was transplanted. Um, any potential source of infection, because you all know what condition you're in immediately following a transplant surgery, and sitting in the dental chair is not a real option to have a root canal or to have a tooth extracted the day after or several days after if you develop a dental abscess of some sort. So this has to be a non-issue prior to transplant. Any root canal that needs to be done, needs to be done prior to any transplant. Periodontal disease needs to be arrested. I've had patients come to me uh, this summer. I had a patient who I had told for three years that we needed to treat her. Uh, put it off, put it off, put it off. And she, I can't walk anymore. I'm in a walker and I can't walk anymore. I'm getting my knee in, in a couple weeks at Rothman. I said, well, you better clear your schedule. And we took her through rapid fire periodontal therapy uh, to get her cleared. Uh, because I told her I wouldn't sign the letter to clear her with the Rothman Institute unless we did that. All cavities have to be filled because a cavity is a potential root canal, and a potential root canal is a potential serious infection. Now, there, before we get to the pre medication questions that you had, I want to talk a little bit about the medications that are known to cause a condition called gingival hyperplasia or overgrowth of the gum tissue. And I have a sister-in-law who is MIT Penn Medicine, did not know any of this. So this is something, you know, I've heard it said before, I think I heard it at one of the meetings I gave for your group, that the patient has to be their own best advocate. And so this is something that definitely needs to be discussed. Anybody in the room on a calcium channel blocker? Calcium channel blockers are notorious for causing overgrowth of the gum tissue. Anybody taking cyclosporin? Probably not. Anybody taking dilatin and anti-seizure medication at all? They usually get two out of three. This is gingival overgrowth or gingival hyperplasia. Where the gum line should be, and how it's puffy and overblown and looks very thick. With calcium channel blockers and dilantin, you get a very thick, almost like, a, like an excessive scar-like appearance of the gum tissue. With cyclosporin, you get more of this boggy, fluid-filled type of overgrowth of the gum tissue. And this overgrowth is dependent to a large degree on how much plaque is present. So immaculate oral hygiene won't eliminate the chances of developing this hyperplasia of the gums, but it will reduce its severity. Now, a lot of people, when they have it, will have it in the front of their mouth because everybody has allergies and deviated septums and chronic sinus problems that they sleep with their mouth open and they dry out their front teeth and the front teeth will usually get it more so than their back teeth. And there are things that we can do to help with that. Now this was a, a teenage boy I treated who obviously was going through orthodontic therapy and wasn't taking good care of his, his oral hygiene and he developed this hyperplasia simply from just not keeping his mouth clean and he also had severe allergies and was bleeding through his mouth when he slept. So when we talk about periodontal disease and heart disease, it's not just about losing teeth, but there are other systemic risks involved. And I, I guess really the take home message for tonight is that we have to really focus on this relationship between the mouth and the rest of the body. There are some thoughts that people with active periodontitis double their risk of developing heart disease. And certainly somebody who has received a transplant does not need to increase the risks of developing cardiovascular. How close and accurate is that? It's pretty accurate. I have to tell you, it, 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 it's pretty accurate. 
and the position paper that was out this summer, I, I you know, I, I, uh, I ran into three cardiologists this summer after the paper came out who I happen to know. None of them knew anything about it. Now this fall, for the first time in the 14 years I've been in practice, patients are coming to my office from their internists and their cardiologists. It's finally, I think it's hitting home, and, I, and I, for the wrong reason, I think it's hitting home because the physicians don't want any new reason to be sued. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and I think when, when the, a position paper comes out and there are guidelines and you don't follow those guidelines, you probably leave yourself wide open for some of the nonsense that goes on. Okay, so what are the steps to limit the entry of bacteria during a dental... Eric, comment on what your story and see what you think. Well, listen, I, I mean, I in good conscience could not stand here and say... That's the reason. There's absolutely no reason that you should have had a heart attack if you were brushing your floss. <laughs> and I would love to say it only because then you could tell 10 other people yeah. to brush and floss or they're going to have a heart attack, and that would get everybody to brush and floss. And certainly, you know, nobody from the Academy of Perry was going to come out and say this, but look, we have a profession if we have patients. And if patients are walking around saying, oh my God, I'm going to have a heart attack, I better see a periodontist, it's good for us. But the reality is, it's good for everybody if we're, we're taking a more of a proactive stance. I mean, you know, you, how can you watch television and not see a guy riding a bike talking about how if he was taking Lipitor 10 years ago, he wouldn't have had a heart attack? Or, a woman's taking this medication uh, because her bone density is important to her. And, you know, I think the drug companies have a lot to change about themselves, but the one good thing that they are doing is creating awareness. And, you know, unfortunately, there's no money in it for any drug company to say, go to the periodontist because it could affect your overall health. So that message is really... It's up to the dentists to educate the patients to diagnose these things early and refer them to the periodontist. And it's up to, you know, certainly people like yourselves who are not your average citizens who have a heightened awareness of their overall health to, you know, would be conscientious. You know, look, my goal for tonight is that maybe when you go home tonight or when you go to bed, Mm. Look. Is it red? Is it glossy? Is it really bleeding a lot when I'm flossing in this area? I might be getting a sour, bitter taste. Maybe I'll ask my dentist to check me for periodontal disease. Or better yet, maybe I'll go find a periodontist from nearby and let him diagnose me. And you know, the dentist will refer you to the periodontist because they don't want any trouble with the recommendations. But you know, don't you public. The dentist may not be in such a hurry to be proactive, but my goal for tonight is that maybe I, I maybe I taught you something about how your oral health can affect your overall health. Maybe I taught you something about how to be more proactive about your own health as it relates to your mouth and your, and your dental health. And if you ever had you know, if, you're, if anyone in the room is saying, you know what, I really, I wish I could chew better, I eat better, I feel better, you know, look, I'm not selling implants, I'm not, nobody's paying me to do this, but if it created a little bit of awareness that you look and say, hey, you know what, maybe if I ate a little better, or I could chew a little better, if I feel better about myself, it, it, that's great. I mean, that's, the goal was really to just try to raise a little bit of awareness and may, and I'm thrilled that this is being taped because maybe it'll raise a little bit of awareness outside this room and, and it helps people. And that's really the goal. I mean, you were yeah. fabulous. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> you said everything that I wish my patients would say when they come in to see me. Let me ask if there's any other questions. Yeah, Charles? What about uh, the use of Fosamax with mental surgery? 
the bisphosphonates have gotten a really tough rap because of the osteonecrosis of the jaw. And so I will tell you, as the periodontist who was misquoted in the Philadelphia Inquirer two and a half years ago, that, that paper came out on a Sunday. I, I answered a few questions on the phone to an Inquirer reporter. The week that Sunday, the paper came out. And that Monday, I was in the back of the office. I was longer than that. I don't know it was about four years ago. I, came, I was doing a surgery in the back of the office. I came back to my desk. I had a stack of choices on my desk. Every patient in the office that was taking Fosamax or Actinel had called my office because they saw me in the inquiry. And should they stop? I said, oh my God. <laughs> All right, here's the rapid version of that question, the answer to that question. This phosphate given to people with osteopenia and osteoporosis because bone turns over. It's like hair, like skin, dead cells get replaced with new viable cells. They're like rings of a tree. As we age, and as hormones stop being produced, especially like estrogen and progesterone, the bone forming cells slow down. The bone eating cells don't. So the cycle gets thrown off balance, and there is a net loss of bone if the gobblers are eating up old bone faster than the, the, the new bone can be laid down. What these medications do is they, they prevent the gobblers from eating up bone. Okay. Now, the oral medications, Fosamax, Actinel, Bonima, are relatively, all of these medicines are relatively potent. The, injectable, the intravenous ones like Zometa and Aredia could be 500 times as potent as the oral ones, okay? So, the jawbone is a very dynamic bone. It's turning over at a rate 10 times that of your femur because your teeth are sitting in the jawbone and there's a fibrous ligament, the periodontal ligament attachment, and it's turning over. So jawbone is a rapid turnover bone. And these drugs will go to rapid turnover bone. If you took Fosamax for a year, and you stop today, 10 years from now, there's still Fosamax in the drug. It's very potent. But what happens is that remodeling process stops. The reason bones are more dense when you take Fosamax is because old bone sticks around longer. But old bone's crappy bone. It doesn't have a lot of real good blood supply. So the wound healing capacity of old bone is nothing like the wound healing capacity of vibrant, you know, normally turning over bone. So any kind of insult to that bone, like an extraction, like a periodontal surgery, like a dental implant placement, that bone is being asked to respond to a wound. And it can't respond as well because the blood's not it. Now with the oral medications, Fosamax, Actinel, Bonilla, the chance of developing one of these incidents, and osteonecrosis of the jaw just means that there's exposed dead bone. It looks like somebody scraped the gum away from it. And after eight weeks, it's still there. The incidence is 0.7 in every 100,000. It is very, very low. I've had one Fosamax <coughs> with osteonecrosis of the jaw. And it was after I did a surgery on her where I removed a bunch of very infected teeth. And she smokes. And she's been on Fosamax for about 15 years. I have had two patients on the intravenous medications have an osteonecrosis, but there are intravenous bisphosphonates for cancer because it helps prevent the cancer from spreading to the bone. Those are very, very potent. Now, I have a woman on Zometa, which is the big boy of them all, zolendrolic acid, 500 times the potency of Fosamax. She's missing a tooth. I am not putting an implant in her mouth. I told her she's going to go get a bridge. We're not doing surgery on her. Do I do sur implant surgery and perio surgery on Fosamax patients? Every day. Three to five years, your risk of a problem is almost zero. Over five years, getting close to maybe 1% chance of a problem. You know, I've had some patients, they've been on it so long, I say, hey, why don't you talk to your physician? See, they'll change it. Maybe they'll put you on one of the other non bisphosphonates if they're that concerned about your osteoporosis. But you know, the physician is so afraid of a hip fracture that they don't want to take people off of it. Now, I can't tell any of my patients stop taking Fosamax. I'm not allowed to. 
I'm not the prescribing physician. Usually it's the gynecologist that's prescribing. Um, but I practice without hesitation. I want to know they're on it, and I want to know how long they're on it, but it doesn't slow me down. If they're on an intravenous, the, the, the other rule book comes on the table. So um, I wanted to know if getting my teeth whitened is an issue, and it doesn't matter what type. As long as it's done properly by somebody that knows how to do it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, no problem. It should be no problem at all. Right. Anybody else with a last question? Before you. I had um, braces when I was younger. Mm -hmm. I was to correct my bite. Now, when you have implants, how is that affected? Well, here's how it's affected. When people come to me, or, for example, and they want to have implants, please just close me something. If there's any, you know, we have what we call the bite of the occlusion, how the teeth come together. If there's any malocclusion, if there's any, you know, when patients close the teeth together function, there's any problems with them, bite adjustment would be necessary, whether it's orthodontics, you know, just some selective grinding of teeth. Any patient that is contemplating orthodontics, typically the orthodontics are done first because implants fuse to the jawbone. They will not move. Teeth, orthodontics mean that teeth are moved through the bone. And as long as it's done properly, the bone will follow. So you know, let's just say you were going to have one done, but you're missing a molar. I put an implant in exactly where it needs to be today. Well, after the orthodontics might not be in the spot that it needs to be in. So the orthodontics is done first, then we place the implants. Now there are times the patients are missing several teeth and orthodontics can't be done because there's no anchorage, there's no post to then pull the teeth toward. So I have placed implants, and the orthodontist has used the implant for anchorage to then pull the teeth back. So we've used the implant for orthodontic anchorage. So every situation has its own specific, specific needs and sequence. Just want to add one little story I heard down at the donor recognition ceremony a couple years ago of a donor wife, meaning her husband had passed away, and she had donated his organs who ended up needing bone uh, transplant. And she thought and asked, and sure enough, his bone had not been fully processed yet. And so she was able to use her deceased husband's donated bone for her bone work. What an amazing thought. And she has often been used at these donor recognition ceremonies as a story uh, to show the value of bone and tissue and organ donation. So with that, Barry, thank you very much. You were as great as you were before. You're not losing it over the years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming out there. Just to, as Steve, I didn't give this to you, so I'm sorry I'll do this if I don't mind. Uh, next month, we're going to meet a little bit earlier because of Thanksgiving. So it's Wednesday, November 18th. And our own John Green from the Gift of Life program is going to talk about his experience over in Berlin where the IODP, the International Organization of Donor Professionals, uh, gathered recently under Howard Nathan's leadership because he was the president of that international organization. And he came back with a whole insight into organ donation and transplantation as it's done differently around the world. And I said, would you come address our most group and share that? So in November, November 18th, he's going to come and be our guest speaker to talk about something which I have no insight to at all, but it should be just as fascinating as tonight was, which takes it right to our own mouths. Harry, thank you very <laughs> thank much. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, that's okay. As far as with, with a patient, a non-transplant patient, whether antibiotics are necessary. Now, I prescribe antibiotics. My, you know, I have a lot of patients who are taking medications like Remicid, you know, severe rheumatoid arthritis, which is an immunosuppressant. And 
I'll work with their rheumatologist in terms of sequencing their therapy so they're at their least vulnerable point. We pre-medicate with the antibiotics. And typically the risk of a severe infection is very, very low in most cases. I, I have gotten the blessings from transplant docs to do this. Now, after the things are healed, this is not, as long as this is healthy, there is no, really no greater risk than having a tooth present in the mouth because the bone will fuse to the implant and the gum tissue will form a seal as well. When, when a patient with a dental implant flosses their teeth and they take the floss below the gum line, they're not taking the floss down to the bone. There's a gum attachment to the implant as well as a bone attachment. And as long as it is healthy, now look, if this woman doesn't floss and doesn't brush and doesn't keep these guys clean, a plaque accumulates all over, you are on the money. It is a potential infection, just like it would be with a tooth. You know, teeth are, are bizarre. Teeth and fingernails are the only two structures that puncture what we call the integument. They, they go from the inside of the body to the outside of the body. And the majority of times, as long as we keep them clean and we proper good hygiene, they are not a source of infection. Have I ever had an infected implant in any of my patients? Absolutely. Most of those patients are the patients that I place the implants and they disappear. They fall away and then they come back and, oh, my dentist said there's a problem. And the dentist never really emphasized patient. You know, this exact type of treatment is what I did for the woman that I met at this meeting a few years ago in her upper jaw. And, and she did do quite well with it. Now, is every single transplant patient a candidate for implants? Probably not. Every person walking around isn't a candidate for it. Proper oral hygiene, medical stability are, are critical. You know, a patient who comes to see me without any history of transplant that has active periodontal disease that wants an implant placed for a missing tooth, I won't place it until we get the perio under control. And I will tell them that they can drive off the street and have no problem finding five oral surgeons that will put that implant in. But part of my responsibility as a periodontist is that their overall mouth is healthy and the same deep pockets around their teeth that serves as a source of bacteria the periodontal disease is a reservoir for bacteria to infect their implants. So you're, you couldn't be closer to the point that we try to make every day with our implant patients, is that you really need to keep things clean. Okay. So this is one example. And now she can wear her lower denture without it rising up. And, you know, the upper dentures will stay in because they form a vacuum seal with the palate. And usually if a patient comes to see me and they're unhappy with their denture, nine out of 10 times it's the lower one because they, they, there's no seal possible because the muscles in the floor of the mouth and under the tongue rise up and down every time they breathe, every time they swallow, when they speak, when they eat. Another example of improving function with implants would be a situation like this. Now this woman has not had upper teeth for 30 years wow. and has lost quite a bit of bone. So for her, I placed implants in her upper jaw, and her dentist made her this prosthesis. Now this is called a hybrid prosthesis. This is a metal framework with acrylic teeth and pink gums on the outside. So it's a hybrid because it's part denture and it's part bridge, and it screws into the implants. And now it stimulates her jawbone, and she can't take this out. So now this is how she looks. She wanted lipstick for me. <laughs> she was so happy. She was in her 50s. She had she had been in the denture since her 20s. And you were able to replace her upper teeth. She can't take it out. It's like she's permanent. permanent. Now. This is another example. This woman has been coming to my office for a long time. She's got a lot of medical problems. And her teeth are pooping out. And this bridge is being supported by a few teeth that are severely decayed. And so she said to me, this was about last year, she said, I'm ready now, doc. Let's, let's get this thing rolling. So 
The bridge was taken out. A temporary denture was made for her to wear for a couple months. So I took the bridge out, I extracted these teeth, I placed six implants. And then her dentist, and in this case, this is a prosthodontist, a crown and bridge specialist, made these gold abutments. And these screw, you can kind of see the screw holes, they screw into the implants under the gum. But look how pink and healthy the gums are. Mm -hmm. They screw in this metal abutment serves the same purpose as a tooth that the dentist kind of whittles down for a cap or a crown would make, but there's no drilling in the mouth. She didn't have to have a single needle at the dentist's office. He unscrews something, he takes an impression, he sent her home with the denture in it. She came back, he screwed these guys in, and he made her this porcelain prosthesis that cements on top of those six abutments that are sticking out. And so, you know, this was no longer working for her anymore. This was on her way out. <laughs> Go ahead. 13 implants. I'm working on my 13th. A lot of them, exactly what he said. There they are. You can see them. Top, same thing. Can't see any gum lines. You don't see anything, but it's there. Been doing this now for 25 years, way before the heart attack. Have an excellent periodontist and an excellent uh, doctor. However, the idea is that <clears throat> the implants are probably better than your own teeth. Certainly better than mine. Mine all fell out, just as you said, why? But the idea is that it's happening and it does work. And I don't know how many you can really tell, but uh, that's what happened. Oh, so <laughs> back shoe. You. you know the back shoe? In Cherry Hill. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's one that. Right. Now comes. Uh, are you ready for anything else? Or you want um, to we'll finish it? I have, I think, one more case to show. And then the floor is yours. No. <laughs> <laughs> the floor is going to be yours. <laughs> okay. So this is the final picture of the one after the bridge. Now this is a gentleman, he's 82, has crowns on all of his front teeth, bit into something, and snapped off his front teeth. Tooth or crown? Uh, tooth inside the crown. Yeah. It wasn't, wasn't much old in the crown. Right. Mm -hmm. This looks like a clean break. The rest of that prep tooth that sticks up was inside the crown that came out. He snapped it. And the canal is calcified. There was no way to do the canal. So, now let me just back up. Now, what are his alternatives? Well, a bridge is an alternative. A bridge would mean extracting this tooth, taking this crown off, taking this crown off, making two new crowns with a false tooth connected in the middle, which would compromise his oral hygiene. He would lose these peaks of gum tissue between the roots and the bone that supported this tooth will collapse. And you have to take off two perfectly good crowns to do it. So a conservative flap, here's the implant, into the extraction socket. Place them into the socket. His dentist and I worked together, put a temporary crown on that just was a little shorter so it didn't touch the bottom teeth. Put a couple stitches in. He walked out of my office the day of the extraction like this. Never went with anything removable. Never went with a space. Always had a tooth there. Just had to be careful for a couple of weeks. About eight weeks later, his dentist unscrewed that temporary for the first time. And look how beautifully that temporary sculpted the gum tissue. It looked almost as if if I was a Photoshop guy, but I'm not smart enough mm. to use Photoshop. I could Photoshop a tooth into this space. And this is a ceramic abutment in the front of the mouth for maximum aesthetics here. This is a zirconia abutment. The screw goes through this into the implant up here, but you don't see any of that. And the crown gets cemented on. This is the permanent. Now, this tooth was never touched. This tooth was never touched. I used the human bone crack material to build back this bone at the same time I put the implant in. And this is the this is how we looked about three months after the extraction. Never had to touch anything except that one spot. 
tell me how you can tell the difference. So, I'm still amazed by it. Now, ways that implants can improve the quality of life. It improves function. Certainly with teeth that are wobbling and falling out, or teeth that aren't there, function is significantly improved. It improves aesthetics over where we started with several of these situations that I showed you. It certainly can give somebody more confidence to have this kind of aesthetics and function. You seem confident. Oh yeah, he's confident. <laughs> <laughs> right, Marie? Absolutely. <laughs> And nutrition is improved. <laughs> nutrition is important for everybody, but certainly somebody that has any kind of medical compromise, immunocompromise, you know how important proper nutrition is. So I will be happy to take questions, and I just want to say thank you for, for your attention. Jerry, you want to bring the lights up for us? <laughs> adhere very firmly to the tooth. Plaque just kind of sits there. Now if it becomes calcified, the tartar you cannot. So if you brush properly, the plaque will go away and it won't calcify and you won't have the tartar. But the tartar needs to be professionally <coughs> I was sharing with Barry earlier, uh, most of you know my wife Pam, and she's a donor mom. And that was her relationship to what goes on around here. And she's married to a heart recipient. So that was both sides. She had some dental work done, like he described, never realizing that what she was getting was donated bone. So when we talk about organ and tissue donation, never made the connection. It was years later when something happened, I don't know, with a presentation like this, she became, oh my God, I'm a recipient. <laughs> so now when she's out there, she talks about the fact that she's both a donor mom and also a bone a bone recipient. And the other thing that I, I love sharing, uh, there was a meeting up in Woodbridge, New Jersey, and as part of that meeting was held at the tissue uh, recovery facility up there at the campus with like three or four big buildings. And part of the meeting, they took us for a tour. And as Barry described, you were seeing sterility unlike anything I've ever heard, not like you see in a hospital. I mean, that's not even in the, the scope of it. And we started down the basement where the freezers have the donated bones. In, in, um, they, they hold them for a while. What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, before they use them. They're cryogenically preserved. Right. And so all the serology and DNA testing, now they're using uh, riboclade, ribonucleic acid testing. But they don't go into use right away is the right. point. They're, they're held in abeyance for a while. And then they took us through all the rooms and to see people in the condition you're talking about, you know, look like spacemen, right? In these rooms, working with creating tubes of the paste he's talking about that he blends with the protein. Absolutely amazing to realize, I mean, we think organs, whoa, yeah, and tissue, you know. And we've really gotten very good at telling people, you know, tissue is not the weak sister of organ donation. You know, if you, and I think in terms of cornea, wow, somebody can see again. But the tissue we were talking about here, it was absolutely amazing to see what it did and how it can be used. And here she was surprised to find out she was a uh, tissue recipient. We, we use, in, in my field, the majority of the, the transplanted material is bone. Now, we also have skin that we use. Some of those grafting procedures, you know, there are times that patients will come and all 32 teeth after session. I'll, I'll joke with them. I'll say, you know, you only have so much palate to donate, and then we have to go to your buttocks. <laughs> I'm just joking. And, uh, and there are times that we can use it. The commercial name is Alloderm. And I know burn units use a tremendous amount of Alloderm. Um, plastic surgeons will use Alloderm. And we use Alloderm uh, for various applications. The bone grafting that we use um, is just, you know, my training. Is, is in bone regeneration. I mean, that is the bulk of my training. And every once in a while I get a patient that hears human bone, I don't want anybody else's bone. And I can probably comfort them and let them forget about any concerns in about two minutes. Uh, there are synthetic graphs that we do have for patients that just for whatever reason won't do. I teach a pen 
and for some crazy reason, I'm the only one that doesn't go to the caliber first, the caliber yeah, that, 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 that is used in most cases. I don't like it because it doesn't go away. It stays forever. Now, the results are just as good as with the human body. But I will always say to a patient, you know, if you're okay with cow bone, why wouldn't you want human bone? Let's keep it species specific. Okay. And, and, it, and it is amazing. I've toured the LifeNet facility, and there's like a triple air sterilization system in the walls. And it is just, you know, and, and I've spoken with some of the physicians that have done the recoveries in, you know, it's within 12 hours of time of death in a, in a sterile environment, and it's the long bones, it's the bones from the legs and the arms that, that we use, and they will bring prostheses with them to the recovery so that the donor can then, you know, have a proper memorial and be placed in a you know, suit or whatever, and not look as if something is missing, and they pay a tremendous amount of respect to the donors. This, at this particular place, and I think they do it almost all of them. And, and it's really remarkable. And I, you know, I don't think about myself as a transplant surgeon, but I would say at least once a day, sometimes four or five times a day, I'm using, I'm, doing, I'm performing an allograft transplant. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it, and it's just, it's, it's just a phenomenal service that I. Have. Are you? You mentioned as we were talking before the meeting, when he opens up a tube or whatever. It's with reverence, realizing it's not just a tube of stuff. This is a person who said yes. And I share that because we're out talking to patient, uh, to audiences, talking about this whole process, encouraging organ donation. And we've often talked about the reverence that physician, uh, physicians have or surgeons have when they're placing an organ. I never thought of it, and Barry very much, why don't you say it, Sheriff Barry? I mean, well, you're better you better than I do. you think about it, you know, <coughs> My position is a little bit unique because when the surgeons are perform, perform your transplant, you are not talking to them at that moment. Yeah. I'm talking <laughs> to the patient. And, you know, a lot of times I get asked the question, where did this money come from? And I'll say, it came from the Mensa tissue bank. So you will do the crossword puzzle letter tomorrow. The person that donated this bone had a very high IQ. And, 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 and you try to, to you know, to lighten it up because they're, you know, they're not happy that they're sitting in the chair, but, you know, it's a very, um, you know, it's very gratifying for me to be able to be a, a very small link in this chain and to then come and talk to patients who have had organ transplants and be able We're to... We're donor families. Right. Tom. Right, and to say, listen, you know, it helps so many people. You know, the person that donates a bone could potentially be helping 50 people from the amount of bone that is used. And, you know, you, you take a patient who is, is faced with losing their teeth. Okay, it isn't like they're losing their leg. But to some people it is. And to some people, it is it is an absolutely traumatic experience to be faced with potentially losing teeth. And for me to have the ability to say, guess what? I'm not going to let you lose this. You're going to follow the program. And we're going to get going. And we're going to use transplanted bone. And we're going to build back what the disease took from you. And uh, you know, when their teeth are still there, and they're having their teeth cleaned five, six, seven, eight years later, and they're all still there, it, it's tremendously rewarding for me. I think, uh, Dr. Kimba, can you tell us about the latest in the clinical trend, uh, implant area where you go in the morning and the entire clinic is set up just for implants. So you might have to spend six or eight hours there at the end of the day, you walk out with your implants. That's how far this has come. Well, that, that is something called immediate loading, immediate temporization. Um, you know, you're, you're today is my last lecture that I'm really going to enjoy. And now the next few lectures I'm giving in New York and in Geneva are all on this topic. Really? And you know, it's it's the it's it's one of my true passions of what I do, what I teach at Penn is this immediate where I will take teeth out place the implants into the extraction sockets, 
and provide the patient with teeth the same day. Um, you know, we have a CAT scan machine in our office so we can assess the bone density, the bone availability, and, you know, the biggest hindrance to patients going through implant treatment has always been, I don't want to be without teeth, I'm not wearing a denture, I don't want to have a space, I don't want to take something in and out. And that really slowed people down. Or, oh my God, my friend did it, it took two years before it was finished, and I can't do that. And for me to say, well, here's how we're going to do this. We're going to get a CAT scan, and we're going to make sure we can do what I think we can do. And then we get the scan, which takes 14 seconds, at one-fifth the radiation of a hospital CAT scan. I have a picture of the three stooges that they stare at for 14 seconds. <laughs> Scan is up in the room where they're sitting five minutes later. I can place the virtual implants on the computer while they're sitting in front. Okay, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to send you back to your dentist. They're going to take some impressions of your teeth. In. They're going to make some temporary bridge work. And then you're going to come back. I'm going to take these teeth out. I'm going to put the implants in same time I take these teeth out, and we're going to use the bone graft material to rebuild the bone around the implants. And then the dentist and I are going to attach this temporary bridge that is going to look better than what you have now. And you're going to walk out of here with teeth. And then you're going to be super duper careful for a couple of weeks <laughs> and eat very soft foods and keep things super duper clean. And then in about 12 weeks, your dentist is going to unscrew this temporary prosthesis and he's going to screw something in and take an impression. He's going to put your temporary bridge back in and you're going to go home and go back and wait. And you're going to come back and he's going to screw in this beautiful porcelain reconstruction. And you're never going to go without your teeth. And all of a sudden, I don't know what you can do. You can do that in one day? If you plan properly, you can do it in one day. The teeth that are screwed in, do they have to screw them out at night? No, no, no. They, they, wow. they, 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 they screw into the <laughs> implants, and we use a torque wrench, like an engineer would use, to yeah. a certain torque value, and we tighten the screw, and then we seal the holes over with some bonding. You can't take it out. <laughs> what are they called again? They're, they're the implants. The implants, implants. okay. Yeah. It's just a screw retained prosthesis. Sometimes they're cemented on. Uh, usually, sometimes acrylic. Sometimes acrylic. For the larger reconstruction, sometimes it's acrylic because one, it, it keeps the cost down for the patient. Two, it's about the same aesthetically. And three, it's a heck of a lot easier to repair if anything ever chips or cracks on acrylic than it is to repair for this one. Want to one? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> take it out. No, I can't. So, but for an individual to replace one tooth, mm -hmm. right? This is you need you and another dentist, you know, like your regular dentist, mm -hmm. and you do the surgery. I do the surgery, and I usually will do the temporary, but then the general <coughs> dentist will make the permanent. You know, I have a couple. Oh, I have one general dentist too. I lectured with. We teach together. He comes to my office. Usually we do it together. I had a patient yesterday who I took out an upper tooth behind her eye tooth. And she didn't want to have a space and she didn't want to have, she had an implant in front of that one already. And she didn't want to have a space. She was going on a trip in a couple of weeks. And so I took an impression during the surgery. And then she left my it took about an hour. She left my office about an hour later with the with a box with the impression and she went over to her dentist and he took my impression and made her temporary and he screwed it in. And he said he I emailed him pictures of the procedure while she was in the car. <laughs> and he emailed, he emailed to me <coughs> pictures of the temporary after she left his office. So when I went to bed last night, she had a tooth and uh, she never the only time she had a space was from my office to his office. <laughs> It's like a post that's stuck into the bone, into the bone. And it's nothing more than tightening it up and putting something in that little post that you can screw in the tooth into that post. It's screwed in so nicely and tightly 
That's the only Oh, it's amazing. And you'll never have a cavity? You'll never have a cavity. <laughs> <laughs> so far as the insight is concerned, is there any restrictions with regards to the bone? In other words, do you have to have a certain bone? Great question. Yeah. Here's, the, here's, here's, the take, here's my answer to that question. In the 80s and the early 90s, people would come to see somebody like me, and the question was, am I a candidate? And my answer was yes or no, and it was totally based on how much bone you had. If you had enough bone for that implant to go in, yes, you're a candidate. If you didn't, I'm very sorry, you're going to have to wear a denture, you're going to have to wear a partial, you're going to have to have a bridge. The answer to that question now is yes, you're a candidate. Let's see what we have to do to get the process completed. Or no, you're not a candidate today, but we can build back the bone, and then you'll be a candidate in six months, or four months, five months, six months, nine months, depending on what it is. It's very rare that I will have to say to a patient, I'm really sorry, but I can't, not even once a year, I think, is it, I, I'm really sorry, I, I can't help you. Um, you know, using these, these growth factors, these proteins combined with the bone graft material is just unbelievable. It's like it's turbocharged the whole process. And, and being able to take a patient who really can't eat and replacing some teeth is very gratifying. You know, my mother wanted me to go to medical school. I don't know why I would go to medical school. I forgot why. But I didn't. I was going to go into the family business, which has nothing to do with anything we're talking about. And I hate it. And my brother should always write me checks because I'm the oldest. And now they're going to <laughs> And somehow I wound up in dental school. And I knew right away I was not going to be a general dentist. Drilling and filling teeth was not my thing. But I thought I loved the whole bone just excited me. The whole dynamics of bone was very exciting. And to learn how I can use different grafting techniques to build bone back to either keep teeth or replace them has is, is, is opened up a whole new arena where people come in. I've had patients come in and say, well, I was told by two different people I can't have implants. I don't have enough bone. I said, when were you told that? Oh, last week. Who's still practicing that for me? What are you talking about? That's your own problem. So. Right. <laughs> well, you've got to educate everyone. Well, that's the thing. I mean, of course. You know, and, and, and you I got just, some of these dentists that have been around for 60 years. They're not changing. Right. They don't. They don't want to they learn, and they don't want to know. And, and you know, and like I said, this is not a solicitation lecture. No. I, you know, Janice is my Janice has been my patient since I'm in practice, and I treated Jessica for a few years, and they got me active in this organization and to present. And I love giving this presentation because there's all these questions, and everybody in the room is here because they want to be here. And you know, yeah, I'll yeah. stay as long as you like and answer. Me. I have one question. Sure. Two questions. Uh, first of all, very entertaining and delightful. Yeah. I am I'm trying to go right now, but I had to have a bridge for my first transplant, my bottom four T. Okay. Now, if I want to get an implant, would it be feasible, necessary, and what would the cost factor be versus the? I got a pretty good deal on this with my friend's brother was a dentist. Okay. Our, Families in, so gave a really nice price, like $700 for a 30 dollars job. So I put up a pretty good deal. That's a good deal. Right. <laughs> 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 it would cost probably 10 times as much. Well, I don't know. I mean, you know, is it the lower front four teeth? Right. And so the two eye teeth are supporting the bridge. Right. It's okay. I lose them. That's the only down like. They come out? Oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, now here's the story with that. First, you don't need an implant for every tooth. Certainly in the front of the mouth, we actually go out of our way not to put an implant in for, for aesthetics. In the back of the mouth, on a, on a guy that's grinding away, we might. Now, how feasible is it? I don't know. Depends on what you need. I mean, it's not out of the question to say if those two canine teeth are healthy, the bridge probably shouldn't be coming out. No, I mean, if it's never come out, and it's healthy, you may not need to replace it. If 
let's say the reason that you would need to replace it would be one or both of those K9 teeth develop decay and the bridge is coming out. Or develop decay and the bridge needs to be redone, and maybe this time instead of having a bridge, you'd save those teeth and put crowns on them and then put in crowns. If I'm replacing teeth from the canine to the canine, which is six teeth, normally that would be either the two implants for the two canines and then replace the bridge on the two implants, or possibly place a third implant and replace one of those four inside the I mean, you certainly wouldn't put six implants in there. Right. Um, how feasible is it? I don't know. If you're missing those teeth, you're certainly missing bone. Where are those teeth work? Now, building that bone back may be something that could be done simultaneous with placing the implants, or would need to be done in a separate procedure prior to placing the implants. And the way we find out is with the three-dimensional image or the CT scan to find out how much bone is there. Now, cost-wise, you know, to replace, I mean, hypothetically, I'm, I mean, I'm just, I'm, I always tell my patients, I mean, really, I'm not passing the buck to my office manager. I'm just as good a surgeon as I think I am. I'm a terrible mathematician. Let me get you off the hook. 1,300 to 1,500 is the bone rate right now per implant. But the thing is not to lose sight on it, that that's just for the implant. Once you put the crown on, go back to your dentist, there's an overcharge on top of that. Did I get you off the Well, you know, <laughs> more expensive than that. More expensive than that? Yeah. Well, I've got to go, but you're not on the hook when you get the wrong hat on the table. Somebody stole off the table. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. The game is started. Huh? No, I got to go to the church. I got to go to church. Oh, OK. Not really. Let me uh, just give you the background on why I'm here. Uh, I was certainly the poster child for what you just saw. 25 years old, couldn't care less about my teeth, didn't know anything about it. However, my gum started bleeding. Didn't do anything about it except wipe it off with a towel. Little by little, the gum started receding, the bone started showing and the teeth started loosening. So now I'm in the pickle, I'm in my 40s, and I really you know, have to do something here. Even after that, now the teeth started coming out. So by that time, I was married, I was in my 40s and early 50s, and we started seeing the local dentist, and he suggested to go see the periodontist, and sure enough, the implants were an option. This is way before the heart attack, way before the, the transplant. We started putting them in, and it worked. Everything was fine. And then I had the heart attack at 65, and now I'm a transplant. Still working on the implants and how are we going to move forward with that. So what we did is exactly what was mentioned and that's to get my periodontist and my heart uh, clinic, my cardiologist, Dr. Eisen, we had to get them together. Dr. Eisen comes out and says, continue your work but I want you to make sure that you keep me abreast of every step you take. Periodontist, cardiologist, of the sink. Now comes, what do I do in the meantime? Well, certainly, thank God, we do have a position paper now that kind of tells you this is the things that are happening. Thank God I have the kind of, uh, you know, a, of a clinic, uh, my heart transplant clinic, that understood what I was doing and why and were able to get together with them. So what we did was move forward as long as we have this <coughs> business of uh, still doing transplants, even under the cardiologist's care, uh, it, 
can continue. Right now, I'm waiting for my 13th infant. No problems with it, no reason not to, etc., etc. But now comes, okay, that's kind of what happened. But now comes the reflection. Where did this go wrong? And my biggest concern, and that's what affects all of us, is the idea of was this heart attack and transplant prevented? Had we been in the, when I was 25, had that dentist said, you got an awful lot of plaque in your body and whatever it is, you better be careful. Or at least make sure you mention this to your cardiologist. I might have thought of it differently. I don't know, but I might have. So right now, with the thing that I'm concerned with is whether we can start thinking about this as a preventative measure where this could be building up in every one of us, unknowing because no, no one was saying anything before, and doing something to the infections that we can get from the plaque, from the tartar, and what have you. The first time that I heard that the cardiologists and the, uh, and, and the dental profession were working together was with this idea of the positions that we should be in. Uh, it's too late for me now, but I'm thinking maybe if we can emphasize enough. I don't know whether it was the, uh, the plaque inside my arteries or whatever it was, but it sure could have been. And I don't know, maybe I'm just suspicious, but I think it had a lot to do had I known about it. Well, that's procedure. Now we're going to get to your question. And, and if I don't answer it fully, please stop me and we'll go yeah. as deep as you want to go. We need to treat any existing infections. That has to be treated. Antibiotics prior to procedures. More regular maintenance, and I'm going to get back to focus on it more. Periodontal patients, patients who have been treated with periodontal disease, and this is not my regimen, this is a regimen developed in the 40s and the 50s. Patients with periodontal disease should have their teeth cleaned every three months, not every six months. Now that's an, obviously a very generalized statement. I have certain patients who come once a month. I have some that come, we bargain you know, every four months. A large portion of my patients will see me twice a year or see my hygienist twice a year, and they see their general dentist twice a year, and they alternate. But four times a year is the standard regimen for anybody treated for periodontal disease or anybody at greater risk for periodontal disease. And rigorous, rigorous, rigorous oral hygiene or home care. Now, treating existing periodontal infections. I love this picture. I mean, this, there's a very short story behind this picture. My sister-in-law got married about eight or nine years ago. And at her rehearsal dinner, the bartender started talking to me. I was in surgery from 8 o'clock to 6 o'clock. I was so tired that my wife made me get dressed and go to this rehearsal dinner. I was sitting at the bar talking to this guy because I didn't have the energy to mingle. And he asked me what I did and I told him and he came in to see me. And he opened up his mouth and I said, oh my God. I said, what? I said, what, uh, what is this? He said, I learned this in the service. My teeth got loose. So I took floss and I wrapped it around my teeth a couple years ago. And the tartar grew over the floss and made a bridge or a splint. Some of these teeth were not even in the gum and bone. They were floating outside the gum and bone, but they were all held together by the floss and the calcified plaque or tartar that connected it. And I, I just, I was so fascinated and how desperate he was to not lose any teeth that he did this to himself that I, I just like to show this picture. <laughs> how old of a person? He was in his 40s. And just had not had dental care in years. And he 
I mean, and this was not, this is not, he didn't buy this floss this year. I mean, this is, <laughs> <laughs> this is old floss. You know, we took some x-rays and he had about no bone around his teeth. I never saw him again, but I was glad I got the camera. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, we split loose teeth sometimes with a fiberglass <coughs> resin or a wire and a composite resin, and I don't know that we could ever do better than what he did. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first periodontal split. So, you know, one of the important things to stress here is that although periodontal disease is hidden, you know, I once, when the periodontal disease, heart disease, connection started to make it into our journals about 13, 14 years ago, I heard uh, Dr. Stephen Offenbach from, from North Carolina, who was one of the original researchers, give a presentation in New York. And he said, a patient with generalized advanced periodontitis has about the size of a wound of 16 inches on their skin that got infected. But you don't see it. If you had a if you had a cut that was infected, especially everybody in this room, who had a cut that was infected, I don't think we'd have to think too hard of what your physicians would want you to do. But because you don't see it, and you don't feel it, nothing gets done most of the time. And a lot of general dentists are not focusing on this. They're focusing on the cavities they can fill, the crowns they can make, and things like this. Now, what is the regimen for dental appointments? For the standard regimen, it is to take 2,000 milligrams of amoxicillin, or four 500 milligram capsules, an hour prior to dental procedures. Now, the old regimen was to take six pills an hour before, and then to take three more pills six hours after the initial dose. And I still have a few transplant patients whose cardiologists want them to take the old regimen because they are just playing it very close to the vest. For the penicillin allergic patients, the regimen is normally clindamycin or cleosin, 600 milligrams or 450 milligram capsules an hour prior to dental. There are other regimens as well. There's a regimen of Zithromax of 1,000 milligrams an hour before, which comes in the z -pack. Um, But it's always important to consult with the cardiologist prior for me, anytime a patient comes to see me in my office, whether they're an 18 year old healthy kid that cracked the tooth in a sports accident, or a 70 year old gentleman with advanced periodontal disease, a medical consult goes out. And it's amazing. The first 10 to 15 minutes I spend with every new patient in my office is discussing their medical history. And then we consult the physicians. And it's amazing how much you find out. Now, the reason that this is controversial is because this regimen applies to patients with joint replacements, depending on who the surgeon is, for the first year, for the first two years, for the first five years, or forever, depending on who it is. I think the Rothman Institute, it's the first two years, and then they don't think they need them anymore. Patients who have had conditions such as mitral valve prolapse, a heart murmur, we're also doing this. So I would say about 10% of the patients in my office were premedicated. About two years ago, the American Heart Association issued new guidelines. And now, it's not necessary. Unless there's been a heart valve replacement or heart valve surgery. The joint replacement is a totally different issue. But over 90% of the patients who had had mostly innocuous heart conditions, such as murmurs and mitral valve prolapse, um, don't have to premedicate anymore. Which has made my life easier because we don't have to send as many patients home because they forgot their medication. Remind me. But I've always still deferred to the cardiologist about this. Now, you guys don't qualify to stop thinking. <laughs> What good does it do? I think of, I mean, I, I take that, sure. um, but I think of amoxicillin as a penicillin type medicine, right. and you know, I'm used to taking penicillin when I get when I get sick, and it's a you know a ten day, two week regimen. Sure. 
what's the value of taking one dose one hour prior to dental work? What is it, what is it doing? The thought, well, the thought is that any kind of manipulation in the mouth when you're having your teeth clean, any kind of dental work done, is going to cause some bleeding, even on a microscopic level where you may not see the mm -hmm. flesh. Right, and in that bleeding under the gum line gained, allows entry for the bacteria that form plaque under the gums as well as above the gums. And that same bacteria will go directly to damage, heart valves, prosthetic, knees, joints, whatever. This regimen of amoxicillin has been found to be effective to significantly reduce that bacteremia from happening if it's in your systemic blood system for an hour prior to the introduction of those bacteria in that game. Uh, my general dentist will not work on me even to brush my teeth unless I take the amoxicillin at least two days before and an hour before. Well, I don't know that that's supported. I mean, that's her, no, well, yeah. it's, it's a woman. Right. <laughs> that, that's, she does, will not work on it. It can't hurt. It, okay, you're right. It, it can't hurt. And, you know, the, think the thought process, you know, this is, I, I guess our society is so programmed, you sneeze, antibiotics. And everybody's on antibiotics. And, the, and if you talk to people, epidemiologists and the CDC and so forth, you know, the emergence of things like MRSA, this, this methicillin resistant staph, or this, all of these staph infections, all of these antibiotic resistant infections that are starting to pop up that you've never heard of before, they feel is directly caused by the over-prescribing of antibiotics. Because bacteria will mutate. They will overcome, you know, when penicillin came out, it was fabulous. Now, why is there amoxicillin? There's amoxicillin because it's a broader spectrum, because penicillin doesn't kill everything that amoxicillin will. Why is there augmented? Augmented is amoxicillin with clavulonic acid, which hits bacteria that now aren't killed by amoxicillin. You know, bacteria will mutate. They face a challenge, and the weaker ones die, and then the more stronger virulent bacteria then multiply and there's genuine concern of, of resistance and that we're going to run out of effective antibiotics eventually. So I think the risk of a bacteremia, look, like you're going to get a bacteremia when you floss your teeth. If you eat a potato chip and you gouge your gum, you're going to have a small degree of bacteremia. I think the American Heart Association just feels that the risk of creating resistant strains of these bacteria outweighs the benefit that over 99% of people are getting from taking these. Now, taking them two days before is not a regimen supported by the American Dental Association, the American Heart Association, the American Academy of Cardiology. There's no, I can't tell you that's the right thing to do. Now, does it hurt? Probably not. No, when I said two days before, I meant two days before and the day before, and then the day Right. Before. And then there's a thought process that if you don't take a full regimen of antibiotics, they'll say you should finish once you start. Well, a three-day course of antibiotics is not a full regimen. So you may actually be, I don't want to upset you, but you may actually be setting up a, a resistant strain by taking a partial regimen. Um, you know, when the doctor prescribes a week or 10 days of amoxicillin, and you stop after four days because you feel better, and they say, no, 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 you have to finish. That's why, because you will kill the weaker ones off quicker. The tougher bugs will stick around, and then they're going to multiply because now you're not taking the antibiotic anymore. So I would talk with your physician, really, and get a regimen that, that, that he or she finds appropriate before dental visits. Just one question. As heart transplant patients, the last thing we do is an infection. We're susceptible to this, and why add a potential for something that we're really 
all has uh, been. Absolutely. Well, well, you know, for my transplant patients, I even go to another step, is that when I perform a surgical procedure, whether it's periodontal surgery, dental implant surgery, uh, you know, there are almost always sutures involved, and I don't want the patient putting a toothbrush over the sutures. So I will prescribe a chlorhexidine rinse for them to use until they come back roughly 10 days later for me to remove the sutures, clean things up, and then show them how to clean the area. A chlorhexidine rinse prior to a dental visit will reduce about 99% of the bacteria that are on the surface of the teeth. And so my transplant patients rinse with chlorhexidine for 30 seconds prior to having their teeth cleaned as, mm -hmm. as an extra precaution. Did I cover your question? Yeah. Okay. okay. Now, regular maintenance is very important. Periodontally involved patients, like we said, should be seen every three months for a maintenance or hygiene appointment. And they'll typically come in to see me four times a year or alternate with their general dentist on both can keep an eye out. And one of the things that my hygienists are, I don't have to emphasize that they should do this. If anything, sometimes you have to cut the lesson short, is go over the proper use of home care. Because something like this is not going to happen over This is something that needs to be emphasized and treated at home by the patient. If you just have your teeth cleaned four times a year and the rest of the year you're just kind of slapping the brush in and out of your mouth, you're really not, it's a, it's a team effort and we have to work together. So what is needed for proper home care? First, a soft and only a soft toothbrush. I will tell you plaque will come off with tissue paper. Part will not come off with a brillo net. And so a soft toothbrush is the only toothbrush that anybody should do. Why is that? So you have that? I never like soft brushes. People don't like soft brushes because they feel it's not working. Mm -hmm. And a medium or a hard brush is going to cause what's called toothbrush abrasion, or actually notches in your teeth. You will, you will take tooth structure away from repetitively scrubbing. I have patients who literally it looks as if somebody took a saw to their teeth from just years of using a hard brush and scrubbing with it. Um, brushing properly is much more important than using a, a hard toothbrush. Flossing is, is critical. It doesn't matter whether it's waxed or unwaxed. Some patients will say, well, the unwaxed works better. I will tell you that the science does not back that up, but if it's going to help you, if it's going to encourage you to floss, use the other one. Use the tape. I can't use tape. My mouth kills me after I use dental tape. I like Goliath floss because it's easy. A rubber tip, and we'll talk a little bit about a rubber tip. These, these conditions like gingival hyperplasia caused by medications are the rubber tip poster child. Things like a proxy brush. And we'll look at what all of these are. <coughs> and Listerine, to this day, is my is really the mouthwash I recommend. Things like this, I, I have no axe to grind with the Crest people, the OLD people, the Scope people, but the only mouthwash that has good science behind it for decades is Listerine. Is it more of the flavors? Um, as long as it isn't the white bottle, it looks like milk and magnesia, okay. because that's a bleaching. I met a young lady, and I'm a little bit of a and her teeth were so white. I said, what do you do to her? She says, hydrogen peroxide. I mean, for years, I mean, since she was coming up, small girl, I came home, I bought a bottle, hell, all, it's horrible. Well, you, if you swallow it, you're going to throw it. <laughs> it's a bleach. Here's what happens. Hydrogen, first of all, hydrogen peroxide may be carcinogenic. It's a free radical. You know, we're taking all these antioxidants to remove free radicals from our body. And if you rinse with hydrogen peroxide, you're rinsing with a mouthful of free radicals. So it may be carcinogenic. It also has been linked to causing ulcerations. In the and one of the things about hydrogen peroxide that scares me the most is that it's a bleach. So if you have inflammation, like the redness that we talked about, it's going to mask it. So your gums may be pale pink. And you can look in the mirror and say, well, I don't have red gums. My gums are 
paint, <coughs> coral paint. But underneath there may be significant tartar and plaque. And so it may mask it. You know, in the 70s there was this, Dr. Kais came out with this Kais technique of baking soda, peroxide, and it was a whole regimen taking tetracycline antibiotic. And it was the other paradox. He was a general dentist, and he had this whole cockamamie scheme of uh, looking at plaque swabs under the microscope, and patients were using peroxide and baking soda, and they're scrubbing away. And he doesn't even believe in it anymore. So I, it looks great. Now, the, the whitening rinse, the Listerine pre brushing rinse, the white, will whiten your teeth to some degree. Tooth bleaching is, I don't do it. For my, I love the general dentist do it. But bleaching is totally safe if it's done properly. The whitening strips work to some degree. The, all the bleaching stuff works to some degree. But I, I, I would caution against hydrogen peroxide. In, in an acute abscess, maybe I'll use hydrogen peroxide with a patient, but I, I don't even remember the last time I did that. I'll usually use uh, betadine or iodine as long as there's no allergy. You're not mentioning the electric toothbrushes? Here's why I don't mention the electric toothbrushes. I don't start with an electric toothbrush with my recommendations because I want to see how the patients can do with an brush. If we have a problem where we're not getting where we need to be, we go to the sonic airs, the brawling, or the. If I say to you on your first visit, I want you to go out and buy a sonic air, and you come back and we're not getting anywhere, I have nowhere to go. I have <laughs> then we have to go backwards and start working with the manual brush, and you're going to be upset you just spent $150 on an electric brush. I like electric brushes, I'm pro power brush. But I think we always no, have I'm looking for my own case. <laughs> Oh yeah, I'm not against using an electric brush, but even with the electric brush, you have to be very careful not to press too hard. I know the new Braun has a little sensor, yeah. and if you press too hard, it beeps. Yeah. It tells you to, to lighten up a little bit. Now, proper brushing, the toothbrush should be at a 45 degree angle to the gum line. And you want to just gently, you don't want to scrub, you just want to gently vibrate the bristles in a back and forth motion. Do about two to three teeth at a time, then move on. But this 45 degree angle, so the bristles are at touching the gums, teeth, the tips of these soft bristles are getting just under the gum line. For the front teeth, we want to move more in an up and down direction. Not so much of a scrubbing, but just an up and down direction. This is the rubber tip. I have a question. Sure. A question. I was always told to brush in a circular motion. There are, there are different techniques of brushing. Um, you know, the, circle, the circles miss a lot, to tell you the truth. This, this 45 degree angle, and then when you're finished but with the vibrating motion, sweep away from the gum line. Just sweep it away. If you want to scrub, you can get your scrubbing drones from the biting surfaces. But at the gum line, you just want to vibrate and sweep away. And that goes for the electric brush, too. With the electric brush, you don't even have to do the vibrate. You no. just have to put it there. You pay for it. Let it do it for you. <laughs> now, when I joined my practice, I thought the rubber tip was a marginal good. And my former partner, who retired a few years ago, was a classically trained periodontist. And he said, Barry, I'm telling you, and he has con he converted me. And now this is one of my favorite tools to get out to my patients. It's not a pick. This isn't to remove popcorn kernels from the tooth or poppy seeds. But it is an extremely important tool with, to prevent this gingival hyperplasia or overgrowth. And what you want to do is you want to lay it. We call this little tip between teeth the papilla. You want to lay it on the papilla. You don't want to use the point to gouge into anything. And then you just want to do little 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock, little rotations, clockwise and counterclockwise. Just enough pressure that the gum maybe blanches and turns a little bit white. You don't want to squeeze it until all, there's no blood supply left. It's in the such. It's in the such. It, in, it increases blood supply and it will literally, through the constant pressure, if you do this every day, take down some of the puffiness or severity of the overgrowth of gum tissue. This is a proxy brush. 
only where it fits. Now, we have many different sizes of these guys in my office. This is one of the bigger guys. The patients will usually say, uh, I want the Christmas tree. There are cylindrical ones. We have little, tiny ones now, almost too small to see. Um, but only where it fits. If you get into a habit of sticking this everywhere, you're going to literally put holes in your gums. That papilla is going to disappear. Floss is number one. If you have big spaces, or spaces that are easily accessed, access, then this is good. But if you're keeping a nice tight contact and there's no gum recession, floss is fantastic. The proxy brush would just go between the teeth gently. It isn't shoved in. And then once again, we're just going to kind of turn it clockwise. We're not going to poke it in and out like we're cleaning a, a toilet bowl. We're just turning it. We're just removing the plaque in the food debris between the teeth. Some of the other oral hygiene aids that we will dispense to our patients, we have Flossomy, a tongue scraper, uh, Listerine. I have Listerine samples all over my this is the floss mate. Sometimes, a lot of my patients have arthritis, and it's very difficult for them to floss their back teeth. And so this guy, you just wrap the floss around here, and there's a little track, and the floss goes through. And then you can hold the wide handle, and you can gently get the floss between the teeth. This is the tongue scraper. Um, I got into the habit way before I had kids of shaving in the shower, so my, when my boys uh, used to hop in the shower with me. This was, I would bring these home and I'd put the shaving cream all over their faces and pick them up so they could look in the mirror and this was their razor. And, uh, I'd bring home a tongue scraper for the boys to shave in the shower. But it's very important to, in terms of removing plaque and coatings and bacteria from the tongue. Now, I'm just going to show an example of surgical treatment of periodontal disease. I, I had to put this on here, not for those with a weak stomach. It's not going to be that bad, and I think everybody in the room is going to be able to handle this. But I wanted to demonstrate how we treat periodontitis. Now, this is a patient. She's actually a, a, a phlebotomist at a hospital uh, not far from my office. And Thumbs are a little bit on the darker side. This tooth is loose because of bone loss, as you'll see. So before I did any surgical procedure, I flowed a little bonding in between these teeth just to split this tooth, act almost like a cast. And then after I raised the gum away, you can see the bone that should have been like so went like this. And this is the tartar on the root that caused the bone loss. So the root is cleaned, all the toxins are taken off the root, the root is, is, is now extremely clean and smooth, glassy smooth, and we still have the bone loss. So this is an application of a growth factor. There are several different growth factors that we use in periodontics to stimulate the regeneration of tissues. This, this is a growth factor. Uh, it's enamel matrix proteins. It's actually proteins derived from a developing tooth bud in the pig. And they do, they make this, this particular growth factor is made in Sweden. And they have found genetically that this growth factor is identical to the growth factor that our developing teeth produce to begin the process of forming bone and the bone attachment to the root in a forming tooth. So we're trying to trick the body into thinking that this root is forming and grow new bone and attachment to the tooth. So it's a form of genetic engineering. So the growth factor is applied. And this, and Jim and I were talking about this, this is human bone. This is bone graft. You know, I, Use my, the bone graft material that I use in my office comes from LifeNet Tissue Bank, which is an AATD accredited bank. It's actually the first AAT accredited bank in the country. And they are a bank for, for their, their, their website is phenomenal. They are just a wonderful group. They're in Virginia Beach. I've been there, let me talk about it. I've done the tour, and it's a nonprofit tissue bank. This bone 
is sterilized 10 to the 6 power. There's never in the history of dentistry been any disease ever transferred from this type of bone. And that includes all the sleazy for-profit places that they, like the guy in New York who was taking body parts. I mean, this, this is a place that does it ethically, does it right, with a tremendous amount of respect for the donor. Where did the bone come from? It comes from organ donors under the age of 50 who, and the reason that it's under the age of 50 is that the proteins that are bound within the bone itself that are capable of simulating bone growth start to decline after the age of 50. Can you take it from the, from the, from the patient itself? Oh, oh yeah, I, I do that on a regular basis. But in an area like this one, where we had bone loss, the, the potential to use that patient's own bone is only available if I create a second donor site. And most patients have enough of me after one site. Um, I, I, I mean, I was just, I was at Penn this afternoon teaching and I was telling one of my residents that they're lucky they missed the era when we were doing sinus grafts um, to grow bone for implants, which we still do, but where the thought process was you had to use at least 20% of the patients on the bone. So we were working in the upper jaw, and then we were doing these horrible surgeries in the lower jaw to make incisions and take these big cores of bone from the patient's lower jaw to then put in a bone mill and crunch it up and put it in their upper jaw. And I told him, I said, thank God you missed it. Now we use growth factors and we use the human bone. And I, it's been six, seven years since I've gone to the lower jaw to, to um, be able to acquire bone. It's another surgery. It's another form of transplant. <laughs> yeah, it's an auto transplant. Now this is an allograft. As you're all aware, I'm sure of the term allograft. This is what we call FDBA, or freeze-dried bone allograft. It is PCR tested. Um, it comes in a particular particle size here, uh, 250 to 710 microns, or smaller than a millimeter. It comes in a vacuum sealed sterile bottle. And I place it into a sterile little ceramic dish, and I hydrate it with the growth factors, and I make almost like a pipe. I place that in the area where we lost them. And we close it up. And you can see now the splinting to yeah. secure this too. And this is the before and the bone levels. Up nice and high. And now the bone fill three and a half years later. I took the splint off this past year. It toots like a rock. I probed it two millimeters. And it was about eight millimeters when I showed you that initial picture. So by using an allograft transplant, we can bring the bone back around to you. Here's gum recession in a severe form. This woman has two sons. One is a brain surgeon at home. The other is a cardiologist at Abington the Hospital. She was so uncomfortable that she couldn't brush effectively. And with this little yellow disclosing solution to show where plaque accumulates, you can see how angry and inflamed her gums are from just not cleaning this area. She saw three surgeons, and all three told her, take these two teeth out, and they put some implants in. And I don't even remember how she got them. But uh, she came to me, and, and, and I mean, the woman is super duper bright and super duper nervous about losing teeth. And she said, is there any way you can try? I don't want to lose my teeth. I don't want to lose these two teeth. I got her numb, and I cleaned those teeth off really thoroughly. And I brought her back four weeks later. Now, I knew the recession wasn't going to be cured, but look how much of the inflammation has resolved from just removing the plaque and the tartar. This, once again, this is the eminine. This is the growth factor I showed you before, the protein derived from the pig. Now, sometimes what we'll use now is a recombinant human bone protein. So we don't, it's not even from an animal source anymore. It's purely a synthetic growth factor. But this is one of the growth factors um, that has the longest history associated with it. And combining that with a graft from the roof of her mouth, 
This was one month after the procedure. And this was three months after the procedure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you look at where we started, and this picture was taken probably four or five years ago. It even looks better. I've got to get a new picture. This, this is my greatest hit with treating the session. But the roof of the mouth graft used to be one of the reasons people would never come see somebody like me. And it was a horrible procedure. And the way it's done now is really with a microsurgery technique. The palate heals like a paper cut. Um, the aesthetics are significantly better. I mean, if you didn't know, we started like this. You probably wouldn't know that anything was done here other than that, wow, that lady's got a nice thick band of healthy pink gum tissue. And, and this is the only time probably I'll ever hear this in my entire career, because there's two sons of physicians. When we finished, she came out to the waiting room and she said, you work really hard. If you want to charge me more, it's okay. Did <laughs> <laughs> you? And I did. I was so, I, 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 I wish I could have recorded it, because I figured I'm never going to hear that one. Usually it's like, I was a good patient. You get discounts for good behavior? So, you know, the last topic, you know, I gave this, pre I gave a presentation, a similar presentation about four or five years ago to your group in King of Prussia. And there was a woman at that group, and I, I don't bring business cards to these meetings. I, I don't, this is not a solicitation or presentation. But a woman heard me and came to find me. And she was wearing a full upper denture. And she had a liver transplant uh, several years before. And she was wearing this upper denture, and she had lost so much bone from not having teeth. And she said, you know, I would really love to just be able to eat. I can't eat. My nutrition is terrible. I'm diabetic. It's, it's terrible. Is there anything you can do? And we talked with her transplant doctors, and the consensus was that if we had the green light to place a couple dental implants to form the denture. And it was like a whole new world opened up for her because she could chew her food for the first time in years. So this woman came to see me. This is not the same woman. But this woman came to see me. She had a bridge. It was a porcelain bridge, looked like teeth, but everything decayed. Her mouth was very dry. Most medications, unfortunately, will cause the salivary glands to produce less saliva. And dry mouth is a major cause of tooth decay because the saliva that washes plaque away is gone and buffers the plaque acids, it's gone. And I have had many patients who, they'll go into the hospital, and I won't see them for a while, and they'll come out after having a major surgery, and they're on a slew of new medications, and almost every medication, including blood pressure medications, antidepressant, you name a medication, to some degree or another, it's gonna cause dry mouth. And they'll come back after maybe not being in my office for six, seven months, and they've got 10 new cavities. Oh, geez, now we've got to put you on prescription fluoride and we've got to get over to your dentist and see what we can save. This woman just had major dry mouth issues and everything rotted. So I took out all of her teeth. I placed two implants. And her dentist put these two little attachments on the implants and made her a denture with these two snaps. And when she puts her denture in, it sounds like when you snap your winter coat. It's a oh. And now the implants are there to stimulate the bone, so the bone won't disappear. She just snaps it in with these two. And sometimes patients will say, well, if I only do two, can I come back and do more if it's not enough? And I say, sure. I've never had anybody come back. In the upper jaw, the number is four, because the bone is much less dense, and the jaw bone is a little different in terms of its geometry. In the lower jaw, I've never put in two for something like this and had a patient come back and say it's not enough by But Mary, one of the concerns that I have, and I have many patients who are immune suppressed, sure. is anything that leaves an opening in the gum line, for example. I mean, when you have a dental implant like this, both between the surgery itself to do it and having something protruding from the skin, aren't you open to infection? During Around the time of surgery, there are some risks, 100%, as they are with anybody. Yeah. Now, you know, at this particular moment, it's it's.